Let's welcome Professor Dmitry Tazopoulos. Niemann Hau. I'm delighted to be here today. I'm going to be speaking to you about computer graphics, which I, I think is a, a wonderful field. One of the reasons is because it brings together a whole variety of other fields. There is no field in science and art that is not fair game for computer graphics to incorporate into what we do. And Today, I'll be speaking about humans and how we can use computers to simulate humans. Uh, people are the most complex natural phenomenon uh, in, known to us in, in the known universe. So you can think of this as being a long-term grand challenge problem. And what I'd like to do today is show you some progress that we've been making on this big and important problem over the years. The motivation for what we do, uh, a large part of that motivation, comes from the entertainment industry. And as you know, computer graphics has been the engine that has been driving uh, the, the multi-billion dollar entertainment industry, both the movie industry and the interactive game industry, both on the software side and also on the hardware side. Now, when we go to the movies these days, we see virtual humans. And it's easy, you know, Hollywood magic is basically giving us the impression that these virtual humans on the big screen are intelligent characters and are doing things on their own. But it's important to realize, I'm sure many of you do, that these are characters that are not not only are they not intelligent, but they're also not even autonomous. It requires humans to make them move and make them move in a, in a realistic way. And uh, here in, on this slide, you see some examples of virtual humans from uh, landmark movies such as Final Fantasy or Beowulf and many more examples over the years um, showing you know, these kinds of characters. Also, as I said, human characters are very important in interactive games because we like interacting. People like interacting with humans, with one another, and so we want virtual characters in interactive games that are at least autonomous, that they can do motion, you know, their own movements, just like real people can, and eventually also become intelligent. So in what I'll, I'll be speaking about today, uh, part of this is, uh, of course, what we have, on the one hand, is physics and simulation, biology, computer science, of course, because all of this has to be simulated on a computer. And, of course, animation is just mathematics in motion. And, so, and of course, there's a lot of art involved. So all of these things are coming together in what I'll be showing you. Now, those of you who are familiar with how um, humans are animated. You know that the state of the art these days is motion capture technology, which requires instrumenting the human body with 3D tracking uh, reflectors, infrared reflectors, and then having an actor uh, recording the, the motion of the body from the actor, both the body and the face of the actor, and then transferring that motion to a virtual character uh, to make that character move, such as Golem here in the Lord of the Rings uh, trilogy. But what we're trying to do in our research is make virtual humans that can move on their own. Uh, let me begin by talking about facial modeling and animation. The face is the, probably the most important thing about the human body that we interact with on a day-to-day -day basis. And here you see the progress in computer graphics facial modeling in a 20-year span from the early 80s uh, to uh, the, new, the new millennium, 2000 or so. And you can see the dramatic 
progress in facial modeling. This, this is a, a geometric model of the face on, on the right, and if you look at it, it looks almost a, as high quality a, as a photograph. It's, you have to look closely to see that this is not actually a picture of a real person, but it's a 3D, three-dimensional model of a, you know, a virtual face. And so visually, this is pretty good, but to make a face like this move in a realistic manner is very difficult still, and that's where some of these movies uh, fall into the uncanny valley, as it's known, where the uh, appearance is great, but the movement and the behavior and the intelligence is not at all great. And so what we're trying to do in our research is close the gap um, between appearance and, let's say, behavior. Uh, so everything works well. Now, for the human face, of course, if we look at facial anatomy, we see that uh, the anatomy of the skin, the skin is not a simple surface, uh, of course. It involves multiple biological tissue layers, epidermal layer, dermis, fatty tissue, embedded muscles, and additional fatty tissue or adipose tissue underneath. And the muscles themselves are highly complicated. There are many muscles even in the human face, as you can see here in this uh, picture. They have Latin, Latin names, and uh, it, it's, it's complicated. These are just artist renderings, uh, artist drawings here. So what we try to do is emulate this in uh, a computer model. Starting with the skin, we build a synthetic virtual skin which is a multi-layer structure. It is created out of finite elements, uh, simple finite elements here. This is intended to be a real-time simulation model. And then we take the many muscles of the face and abstract them into a set of facial actuators that are responsible for facial expression. Then we embed these actuators and the tissue. We uh, form it in the form of a, a person's face, as you see there. And the, Geometry can be captured by, say, a laser scanning device, as you see on the right there, which captures just the shape of, the, of a particular subject's face. And what we have as a result of this process is a face that actually works, a simulation model here. And here it's going through random expressions of random intensities. And as we see uh, when we bisect the model, you can see how it works in the back. You see the multi-layer tissue created out of these finite elements. And those lines back there are the muscles, the facial actuators. And when they are controlled in a coordinated manner, uh, what we get is tissue deformation. The muscle actuators produce forces that deform the tissue. And the deformations on the exterior uh, are recognizable expressions. And then you get all the nice uh, phenomena that we see, such as the nasolabial furrows. And uh, natural types of deformations. So I'll be showing you many videos and images throughout this talk. There's a lot of mathematics behind this, but I'm not going to show you uh, any or many equations. There are many applications for this type of work. The model you just saw was intended as a real-time system. Uh, but we can also use facial tissue models uh, to simulate uh, facial surgery, cranial facial surgery. So here's an example from the work of, of Iftikios uh, Sifakis and his collaborators, where, say you have a tumor on the skin, you excise the tumor, and then the surgeon needs to... to close that defect that is created by, by excising the, term, the tumor. And as you can see how the, the procedure works uh, as it does in, in real life. Now let me talk a little bit about muscles. So there's, muscles are complicated as all these other biological tissues are. And here you can see the hierarchical structure of, the, uh, of a particular muscle. Uh, going, going through the various subparts of it until we get to the, uh, the sarcomeres over here, which actually perform the contractions and uh, result in the forces that are, that are generated in the, in the body. So 
It's very difficult to model even something like this, but we have uh, the work of Archibald Hill from um, you know, the early, early, earlier part of this uh, century, and he actually won a Nobel Prize for physiology and medicine for elucidating how uh, mechanical work is produced in, in muscles. And he came up with this model, which is known as the Hill muscle model. It's a combination of a contractile element, that's this one over here, with a, seri a series passive elastic element, and a, and a, sorry, series passive elastic element and a parallel elastic element over here. And this is known as the Hill model. This is what I'll be using, well, this is what we used in the face uh, simulation that you saw before, and I'll be using it again in uh, the, the models that I'll show you to come. L let's go down the human body. The next important structure is the neck. And that has been very much overlooked with, uh, you know, relative to the face. But as you can see here, it's extremely complicated in terms of the muscle structure and, and uh, the geometries that are involved. Biology seems to be that way. Biology isn't like robotics in the real world. You know, you have a physical robot uh, and, and compare it to a human being. Roboticists like to minimize complexity, reducing the number of actuators and joints of, if possible, as much as possible, because these things are complicated and they break down as mechanical parts. But biology, evolution, seems to go the opposite way, increasing complexity as much as possible, almost perversely so. One has to wonder why, why that is, and I, you know, based on our work, I think it actually helps in controlling these systems. It makes them more flexible, uh, of course, in terms of degrees of freedom, but also in terms of actuation, it's easier to control mechanical systems that have lots of actuators as opposed to few actuators. So we, bu we built a model of the neck, and here you see we have the skeletal structure. It's got seven cerv cervical vertebrae and a skull. Each vertebra, vertebra is, con is connected to the next one by three degree of freedom joints. Uh, ligaments and discs are modeled as well. This leads to equations of motion. Here's a simple formula. It's just Newton's laws of motion. It's basically saying that the mass of the system times the acceleration is equal to force. F is equal to ma, Newton's second law. And we see all the forces that are involved here, gravity, Coriolis, and passive elastic forces. If you turn on gravity, you, uh, what, you, this is expected. The mass of the head collapses on top of this flexible neck. So of course there are muscles there to prevent this from happening by producing forces, contractions. So this leads to moment arm matrices and the active muscle forces that are produced by the actuators in the neck. And what drives this whole system in, in us is neural inputs coming in from the motor system of the brain. And so we're modeling all of this in uh, this particular model. We have 72 anatomically based muscle actuators in three layers. 48 deep muscles, 12 intermediate muscles, and 12 more superficial, long superficial muscles. The challenge here is a big one, how to actuate and control this model uh, the way our brain controls it. And by the way, here's a drawing from Leonardo da Vinci from a long time ago, and one might wonder what he would think of something like this if you were to see it. Now, I'd like to play this short video. It's a, it's a humorous piece that explains how our model works. It was produced for the annual computer graphics conference SIGGRAPH. So let's see if I can... Once upon a time, there lived an expressive face named Pat. One day, Pat found seven vertebrae and a skull that fit nicely. I should now be able to turn my head, Pat thought, but gravity prevailed. As the blood rushed to Pat's head, Pat became introspective. That's it, Pat realized. I can control my head using muscles. Attaching 72 neck muscles, activated by trained neural networks, Pat could now turn at will. This changed Pat's life. 
Pat could enjoy riding a wagon, playing soccer, and even talking to friends. And they all lived happily ever after. Thank you. Muscles in the body come in pairs. Uh, and you have co-activation, co-contraction of muscles enables one to increase the stiffness of the physical, the actuated physical system. So this is illustrated here by co-contracting pairs of muscles and opposing pairs, the system becomes stiffer. So here you see uh, one of those wobbly head dolls on the wagon and you can see as the wagon perturbs the system, the head wobbles a lot, but as we increase the stiffness of the system by co-activating muscles in pairs, on either side of the neck, it becomes much stiffer. So not as much wobble. And now it increases again. Okay, so this just compares the two. I'll move on in the interest of time. And uh, here's another demonstration of that with, with the soccer ball. With low co-activation, the deflection of the head is quite large. And if we increase the stiffness of the system, the deflection is much more. Less. So in addition to controlling pose of the head, the position of the head, we also need to control the head stiffness. And so if you uh, heard the video, uh, it mentioned neural networks. Let me illustrate this as a system diagram, what's happening here. This is our neuromuscular skeletal system model of the neck. As you see, we have uh, the biomechanical face model over here, the skeletal system, the muscles, and two sets of controllers, a low-level reflex controller and a high-level voluntary controller that control the muscles in the system. There's proprioceptive feedback in the system, and the feed-forward and set-point signals go to the reflex controller, while the voluntary controller is based the high-level thing that the, this, the head decides what to do, and the low-level one controls the muscles. The muscles then uh, produce contraction forces, which actuates the skeletal system. And the whole thing is situated in a physical, a simulated physical environment, so with gravity and external forces. And the head, of course, has the biomechanical face attached to it, which is capable of facial expression. And what I'd like to talk about next is the neural network, the neural muscular controller that controls the muscles. These are conventional neural networks in what I'll describe first, which are perceptrons, essentially. Um, and we all know what neural networks are, so let me move on. Uh, now, here's the problem. We want to build a control model that is biomimetic, that it shouldn't need to know anything about physics. It doesn't know anything about mathematics, F equals MA, Newton's laws, nothing like that. But it should work in a physically correct manner. So it seems that the only way possible to do something like this is not through optimal control and the things that robotics people really, uh, you know, traditionally used to think about, but rather to use machine learning methods to do something like this. So let's suppose we have our, our head over here, and it has to look at that visual target, that, that little doll. So let's set that random target pose. Then we can use inverse kinematics to determine, so if we rotate the head to that orientation, we know what the muscle lengths have to be. But remember, the head is, has weight, so it, it'll fall in gravity unless the muscles contract. So using inverse dynamics, we can figure out what the muscle forces have to be to keep the head in that position against the pull of gravity. So this creates basically a set of a, a training data pair. The input is the desired head pose. The output is the activation signal that gets sent, the activation signals that get sent to the 72 muscles in this system. And to create additional training pairs, we can do thousands and thousands of them. Here's like 20, well, illustrating 20,000 random sam samples with putting the doll in random positions in the visual field. 
And so we can synthesize through the biomechanical model an infinite variety of, of training data, and then we feed that training data to our neural network using backpropagation learning. Uh, the neural network learns, and basically what it does is regression in a high-dimensional space. This is the power of regression, basically, on training data, uh, nonlinear regression in a, in a high-dimensional space. And if it's done correctly, the model can then the neuromuscular controller can generalize, so it can go in between things it's seen the training data and generalize and do continuous tracking of the visual target. And here the expression is just a simple thing that relates to how uh, the, the visual target is moving. So this is an illustration of applying machine learning to, to control biomechanical models for, for use in computer graphics and animation. And you saw this earlier, which is early attempts at putting together some amount of social behavior as well. So when you're in a group of people, you want to look at someone, but not exclusively at that person. You want to you know, glance at the other person as you're talking. So these characters here are just doing facial expressions and mimicking each other's facial expressions, but they're doing it in a socially aware manner. So that's the next level up where we're doing behavioral modeling. Nowadays, we're using deep learning to do this kind of thing because uh, we have more uh, situations to train over and vastly more quantities of data, so the conventional neural networks are not sufficient for that, so we use autoencoder stacks and so on to, uh, to push this line of research forward. Let me move on to whole body biomechanics. Uh, here we see the traditional way of doing uh, physics-based modeling in computer graphics. You have a skeletal system, and you put joint motors at each of the joints, which produce torques. And then, uh, of course, there's ground reaction forces, gravity, and so on. And you have to control the system to, do, to make it do certain things. So, I mean, clearly, this is not motion capture, because this is very dangerous to do if you're going to do motion capture. But as a simulated system, it's not a problem. So the way this works is through pose control, where you set up a set of key poses and then use the physics to interpolate between those pose positions and external uh, uh, inputs, such as you know, touching the chair and so on. And the character is able to do this. So this is just a start, because the biomechanical model is very simple. There are no muscles in this model, just joint torques. But nevertheless, it could do some interesting things. As when, once it falls, then it could actually um, get back up again. And this is a, a challenging control task in itself. How, you know, here you can see the strategy of rolling over into a prone position and then uh, getting up on all fours. And remember, there's gravity here, so it has to control its balance as it's doing this task and not fall over. And of course, if the, the actuators were suddenly not working, it would just collapse. So it gets back up. But, you know, that's a start. And what we want, what we've been trying to do is build a much more uh, high-fidelity model of the human body that involves muscles rather than motors, and so, or simulated motors. So here we have a comprehensive, realistic biomechanical modeling of the human body that includes 75 bones or 165 degrees of freedom and uh, a large number of muscle actuators. This one includes... 846 muscle actuators in it. In addition, we have a volumetric finite element soft tissue or flesh in the body, which is uh, 300,000 or so tetrahedral finite elements. And let me go very quickly through this model. Here's the skeleton, all the various bones. If you look at, the again, the anatomy of the situation, you see lots of muscles in the torso. There are hundreds of muscles in the torso that control the spine movement and all of that. Uh, at, the, at the deep layers and uh, more superficial layer muscles. And what we try to do is emulate this complexity by putting in these hill-type muscle actuators into, into our model. So here you see the, the deeper muscles in the back. And bigger muscles are simulated by hooking up smaller actuators. Uh, let's see, we have broad muscles here. Again, this is done 
with smaller additional actuators. And you can see here how many actuators are in the upper body area. Here's the lower body as well, forward, backward, and here we have the muscle geometries that come along with this. Uh, and here you can see the muscles, individual geometric muscles stripped away on the right side so you can see the deeper layers underneath them. And finally, there's a skin on top of the model. So creating the soft tissue simulation mesh is an actual challenge in itself. Let's say we start with the skin geometry here of our virtual character. We create a lump of flesh, which is uh, modeled using finite elements. This is a tetrahedral lattice, seven millimeter resolution throughout the body. We cut out the stuff that's on outside of the skin, and that leaves us with about four million tetrahedral elements, which is too many to actually simulate. Um, and so we do coarsening to create coarser elements in the interior, and this reduces the complexity by an order of magnitude. Then we have the lump of flesh underneath and the geometry on top, and we simply embed the geometry into the soft tissue. And I can't go into the details of how we do this, but this is a pretty good compromise uh, between performance and fidelity uh, that doesn't require modeling individual muscles as three-dimensional objects. So that gets kind of technical, so I don't want to get into that with too much detail. But here you can see the result of this, which is a model that actually works, and um, here he's doing his exercises. And if we look on the inside, we can see that the muscle actuators are actually producing forces between the, the bones that they attach to, and then the bones move and deform, and of course the muscles deform the flesh, which is deformable. And here you see a shoulder view where you could see the flesh deformation over the arms much more clearly. So I, I talked about co-contraction of opposing muscles uh, earlier, and here you could see it again where uh, this is an isometric exercise where our virtual character holds his arm out and then flexes and, let's see, releases, flex, release. So you can see the tissue deformations that result from this. So we've got uh, zero co-contraction on the left and a high co-contraction on the right. And so it looks quite natural. So we wanted to do interesting things with this model, even though you know, it's very complicated and takes uh, you know, quite a bit of time to simulate these various components, but we got very ambitious with it and decided, well, we're going to put it into a fluid, and then we're going to try to simulate human swimming and control the muscles, large number of muscles in this virtual human to produce swimming. So we start with our comprehensive biomechanical body model, which I had talked about already, and then we immerse that in a simulated Navier-Stokes fluid simulation. So this is, you know, a, a, a field onto itself in, uh, in applied math. And then we try to do some, again, biomimetic muscle actuator control. And in this case, because we're dealing with swimming and rhythmic motions, this is characteristic of locomotion in general, that the body produces rhythmic motions, we use what's known as central pattern generators, or CPGs, that control muscles. In the, these are recurrent neural nets at the spinal level that produce rhythmic patterns. And these rhythmic patterns contract muscles in a repetitive rhythmic fashion. So here's a close-up of our swimmer. You can see the, uh, the skin here, the internal muscles, the bones, and um, let's see. and the fluid. So here's a, a system diagram of what's going on. Uh, the swimmer has the ability to perceive its, an, its environment, its simulated physical environment. The brain enables the swimmer, the, the high-level controller enables the swimmer to produce different swimming strokes, like crawl, butterfly, freestyle, you know, those sorts of swimming strokes. And then 
at the CPG, at, at the spinal level, the CPG networks produce the rhythmic act activation signals that go into the, muscle, into the muscles to make them contract in rhythmic patterns. So with this simulation here, you can actually see front crawl. And then we can compare something like this with real footage. In fact, we can have the character learn from the real footage how, how to reproduce that particular pattern in the timing that's shown in the video. And so this particular swimmer actually mimics what the real person is doing in the video. And then the networks themselves can transition quite easily. So here you start a slow swim and then it speeds up. Or, oops, I'm sorry, I, shouldn't, I should not have done that. I think I'm going to have to play this. Let me uh, back up here. So I have to play this one again because I want to show you the second part of this uh, demonstration with the style transition where the character is here doing a butterfly and then transitions quite naturally into the front crawl stroke. And these networks are able to do this sort of thing quite naturally by just switching them. And they do the switch continuously, smoothly, and of course physics interpolates quite nicely as well. So what we have here is a highly complicated multi-physics simulation system where we have three different types of simulators across three different regimes. We have the rigid and articulated body simulation, which is using multi-body dynamics, multiple rigid bodies for the bones. Then we have the deformable body simulation for the flesh, which is using Lagrangian finite element models. And finally, we have the fluid simulation for the water, which is an Eulerian fluid simulator with particle-based level set methods. So these are all quite complicated technically, but they, it's, it's hard to build a single monolithic simulator that can do all of this. These are specialized simulators, simulators and they can communicate with each, at, each other through forces. Uh, and it happens in an interleaved manner where the muscles control the bones, the bones, you know, move the flesh, and of course the flesh is embedded in the fluid, and so there are forces between the fluid and the flesh which produce movement to, uh, I mean, uh, pro propulsion to move the body forward through the water. And finally, let's uh, just look at this video here, which illustrates, well, first the actuators and the geometric muscles, and finally with the fluid added, splashing effects and so on, and uh, you have the whole system uh, working together. Now let me move on uh, to the topic of artificial life. I, I mentioned that AI comes into our work in a very heavy manner. In fact, we go beyond artificial intelligence to artificial life, where the intelligence system, the intelligence of the model sort of cooperates with uh, the biology in some sense, and the biomechanics at the lower level. So here's the artificial life modeling pyramid, the way I see it. An animal, which of course, uh, as we humans are, is a physical agent that's situated in the physics, ph physical world. So we simulate physics at the lowest level. And in particular for animals and humans, we are interested in biomechanics, which is the physics of biological tissues, both hard tissues and soft tissues, and the use of biomechanics to produce locomotion and other task-based movements. Now, an a, a physical agent in a dynamic world needs perception. So we have to build perception models, including computer vision, as part of this uh, overall artificial life system. Perception and behavior and, and uh, locomotion and action are linked together through behavior. So we get into the, bio, you know, the biological study of behavior, known as ethology, in order to do this. Animals are, and humans are, of course, capable of learning from their actions. So we kind of saw learning already in what I showed you. So we come, learning theory and machine learning comes to play in our, in our models. And finally, at the apex of this artificial life pyramid, we have cognition 
where the agent can finally have a representation of itself and its uh, environment within its head and can use this representation to, and, and knowledge to reason and plan its actions into the future, which we think of as being thinking. So to span this entire pyramid is kind of daunting, but we have been able to do this sort of thing. Uh, we need to do it, as a matter of fact, for simulating multiple humans working together in a virtual environment. So I'd like to show you next autonomous pedestrians. And you see here it's uh, a train station, which you'll see a little bit better in a, in a few moments. Uh, and you can see multiple virtual characters in this inter uh, indoor urban environment here. The train station itself is a large space. It's a geometric reconstruction of the original Pennsylvania train station in New York City, the one that was demolished to make, you know, to uh, where they put the, the new Penn Station. And uh, as you can see, it was a classic uh, neoclassical building over here. And here are the historical uh, fo uh, photos from the interior. And this is just a geometric reconstruction of that station. You can see the train platforms over here, the concourse area here, the main waiting room and a, a shopping ar arcade, and the little the little autonomous pedestrians in here. Top-down view, and some close-ups of our simulated humans. And here you see uh, a bunch of commuters and other people in the train station, simulated people, moving around. They don't collide with one another. They go about their business doing things that they need to do, uh, such as purchase tickets over here, talk to one another, purchase drinks and food from vending machines, and, and they, uh, you know, they capture, you know, catch trains and so on in this, in this environment. They get tired, they want to sit, and so on. The activity in the train station is kind of characteristic of uh, human, large-scale human, multi-human activity. It's this kind of ordered chaos that you see that we see around us all the time. This system is intended to be real-time, uh, so of course we're not simulating physics in order to do these. Uh, this, this is just inverse kinematics with game characters. Doing a physics simulation would be too expensive when you're doing thousands of people. But you can see that these characters have perception in their environment. They can move around and avoid colliding with objects and so on. So I don't have time to explain all the details of this, but let me show you some interesting uh, things here. Here you see it, uh, two uh, groups of people coming together in the arcade, and um, these, uh, these two crowds pass through each other. Uh, this is a bit strange because no one here wants to pass on the left. They all pass each other on the right, which of course is, is not realistic, but with changing parameters uh, of the system here, let's see, we can have them prefer to pass on the right, but, uh, but they could also pass on the left when needed. And what you can see here is the formation of lanes of traffic, opposing lanes of traffic in this uh, simulated environment, and uh, that's quite natural. Then these characters are able to plan their actions so here we want to get to the chair, and if the character knows how it is, where it is, then it can walk around and come and uh, finally navigate in a large scale and sit down. So these characters, as commuters in the train station, they would enter the station and then go and purchase tickets and then board trains. So let me uh, see if I have time to play this one. Where we In follow. this video, we follow the male subject bounded by the rectangle. On the stairway close to the entrance, our subject and other pedestrians prefer to stay to the right in order to avoid oncoming traffic. After our subject enters the station, he proceeds towards the ticket booths to obtain a ticket. Our subject joins the line of pedestrians waiting for the available ticket booth. Luckily, he does not have to wait for long. Notice how the pedestrians avoid colliding with each other as they proceed to purchase tickets. 
After he gets a ticket, our subject proceeds to the portal leading from the main waiting room to the concourses. He manages to overtake the lady in green and tries to stay out of the way of oncoming traffic. Note how pedestrians avoid oncoming traffic in the narrow portal. Now our subject feels thirsty. When he spots a vending machine in the concourse, he walks towards it and waits for his turn to get a drink. At the same time, not far away, pedestrians are gathering around a group of girls dancing to music. Feeling a bit tired, our subject finds an available seat, proceeding towards it, and sits down. The clock chimes the hour and it's time to proceed downstairs to the train platform. Our subject passes through a somewhat congested area by following, turning, and stopping as necessary in order to avoid bumping into other pedestrians. The girls are still dancing and are attracting interest from other pedestrians, but our subject apparently has no time to watch the performance. So as you can see, these characters are intelligent characters and you can go in and look at them close up and they do smart things. So it's not just simple crowd simulation as you may have seen in, in games these days. We're actually modeling the, the artificial life pyramid to do this in a bottom-up manner. There are many applications for this kind of work. We've worked with uh, archaeologists to do simulations of activity in uh, ancient reconstructions of ancient sites. This is with uh, collaboration with Brown University. Uh, one interesting application is using these kinds of uh, human simulators in computer vision research. And uh, very quickly, to motivate this, uh, surveillance. That's becoming ubiquitous in today's world. There are many cameras out there in uh, cities these days. And of course, human operators can't possibly look at all of the video feeds that, were coming in, that are coming in from thousands of cameras. So what's needed is autonomous networks of smart cameras, like the ones shown here, which have onboard processing and communications from one another, perhaps in, even wirelessly. The problem is to do research with these kinds of systems in the real world is very difficult or actually impossible for most people. You can't go into an airport and say, I want to do research with the camera system that's over here. They'll tell you, go to your lab. In the lab, it's very difficult to set up big uh, multi-camera systems, uh, networks to do this kind of work. But there's no constraint to do this in the virtual world. And so we have our train station. Uh, we, put, we put virtual cameras down there that capture virtual video, and then we use machine vision algorithms uh, to do tracking recognition of people and so on, and finally, high-level camera control, uh, and the cameras themselves are modeled you know, reasonably accurately. So this allows us to do this kind of research at the high level of how to control cameras uh, in, in, uh, in without constraint, and of course, these virtual humans don't mind being watched uh, as they go about doing their their business. So just to illustrate this quickly, here you see our, our simulated multi-camera system tracking a virtual pedestrian. The operator has said, this is the person I want to track, and then the cameras uh, communicate with one another through a network that's simulated, uh, a wireless network that's simulated, and the cameras can actually use the signature of the uniform, the, the color uh, signature of the, of the person's uniform to uh, track her. In, in with multiple cameras as she moves around. So this is automatic, persistent, multi-camera observation of a person moving through a large space. So one of the several examples, uh, applications of uh, these kinds of uh, human simulators. Most recently, we've been looking at human simulation at the social level. Uh, just as an example of what we can do, uh, let's take door and doorway etiquette. Holding doors for others, door manipulation, and dynamic decision-making in the doorway environment, uh, which we actually do using Bayesian network decision models. 
So situations such as this, where this is at UCLA in one of the buildings, and you can see how people interact socially, holding the doors for one another, and, uh, and so on. You're all very familiar with th this kind of behavior. And so what we try to do is emulate this by building a social model on top of the autonomous pedestrians that I showed you earlier. So let me just quickly... We introduce a real-time simulation framework that is capable of emulating human social behaviors around a variety of doors and in doorways, including the common behavior of holding a door open for others to pass through. Our novel human simulation system can synthesize various types of door holding behaviors while maintaining coordinated order as autonomous pedestrians passing through doorways. So this is proper social etiquette there. And, uh, based, and it defines the roles of the door holder and the follower. A holder may continuously hold the door for two followers to pass through first. If a follower takes over the door from the door opener, the follower will become the new door holder and will assess the next follower before deciding on the appropriate door holding policy. Integrated with our door etiquette framework, a pose-to-pose -pose procedural motion model generates motions by defining several key poses with possible transitions from holder to follower. To synthesize a variety of natural behaviors, our model takes into account both internal and environmental factors and employs a Bayesian network to choose between different door holding behaviors. Additionally, the rush factor influences the walking speed in the doorway. So I'm, all, I'm out of time and I'd like to... Uh, Our approach can synthesize a long sequence of pedestrians see. approaching the door from one side. The inset video shows more hurried and less kind characters. So this gets kind of complicated Here is a sequence sometimes. Of pedestrians approaching from opposite sides. As one side takes over the doorway, the opposing side will queue up and wait for the doorway to clear. The inset video shows interleave passage due to a similar arrival time on both sides. Our door interaction model includes the ability to catch a closing door. Our door and doorway etiquette framework can support different types of doors, such as the revolving door. By modifying the door interaction model, the autonomous pedestrians are continuously able to push and pass through the revolving door in an efficient manner. Hesitation and catch-up behaviors are observed as a consequence of the moving door. Here we see simultaneous passing through the revolving door from both sides. Our system can also simulate social etiquette around double doors with more complex doorway conditions. The autonomous pedestrians normally prefer to stay to the right and pass through the right-hand door. But this is by no means mandatory. In a dynamic situation, a pedestrian may take advantage of a door that is being held open even if it is not the right-hand door. Moreover, as one side gets crowded, subsequent pedestrians will prefer to use the less crowded side, regardless of whether it is the left or right door. Okay, so uh, this? I, I will not play that. Let me just uh, wrap up this talk by, talk by discussing some future challenges. As, as, we, as we've seen, the computer simulation of humans is a difficult problem, spanning many, many levels of detail and, and, and abstraction. Uh, from the physics level all the way up to the social level. And uh, while well, virtual humans are, of course, becoming increasingly useful, not just in entertainment, but also in science, engineering, and the humanities. And really, there are many, even though progress has been made, there are many open engineering and scientific problems uh, still to be addressed and tackled. For example, how can we close the gap between biomechanics and intelligence uh, for large-scale multi-human simulation? This is a grand challenge problem, and it's a high-performance computing problem. You can imagine if we did a full biomechanical simulation, as in the case of our swimmer, for each of the hundreds or thousands of characters in our autonomous pedestrian simulation, how much compute power 
that would require. And, you know, if, if that were feasible, then we can populate reconstructed models of entire cities, such as the virtual Los Angeles model here, where the buildings are all modeled, but as you could see, there are no humans in, in this space. And wouldn't it be great if we could actually put biomechanically simulated and intelligent virtual humans in this type of environment and have it, and have it actually work in, you know, in feasible computer time? That's a, a very difficult and, and challenging problem that spans multiple levels of computer science. And also tackling the, the massive data-driven, high-dimensional real-time learning uh, or machine learning problems that have to be done for neuromuscular control is a very important challenge as well that I'm personally very interested in these days. The nice thing about virtual environments, though, is that we can synth synthesize unlimited amounts of training data from the simulation itself. In the real world, we have to actually measure training data from real people, which is a little bit uh, more complex uh, and challenging to do. But in the virtual environment, we have all the ground truth information and can simulate the data in real time. So I think much more research is actually required to un both understand people and then reverse engineer people in a sense so we can make them into fully functional virtual people. And of course, all of this work is done by my former PhD students, uh, four uh, Chinese students in, in this list, and uh, a former postdoc. So this is in the order in, in, the order in which the work was presented. Um, and uh, I'm very grateful for having all of these uh, very smart, intelligent students uh, working with me. It's all due to them. Thank you very much.